Hello, and welcome to Noon Conference, hosted by MRI Online. Noon Conference connects the global radiology community through free, live, educational webinars that are accessible for all and is an opportunity to learn alongside top radiologists from around the world. We encourage you to ask questions and share ideas to help the community learn and grow. You can access the recording of today's conference and previous noon conferences by creating a free MRI online account. You can also sign up for a free trial of our premium membership to get access to hundreds of case-based microlearning courses across all key radiology subspecialties. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Stephen J. Pomeranz for a lecture on wrist MRI. Dr. Pomeranz is the CEO and Medical Director of ProScan Imaging, Chair of Naples, Florida Community Hospital Network, and the founder of MRI Online. He's authored numerous medical textbooks in MRI, including the MRI Total Body Atlas. Dr. Pomeranz is also an avid conference lecturer and chairs this, the fellowship training program in MR and Advanced Imaging. We're thrilled he's here today to share his expertise with us. At the end of the lecture, please join Dr. Pomeranz in a Q&A session where he will address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. With that, we are ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Pomeranz, please take it from here. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, everyone, wherever you are in the world. We're talking about wrist MRI, which is a complex subject. The further away you get from the trunk, the more detailed the anatomy, but, but it is a joint, unlike the ball and valve joints, that makes some sense. So it's not quite as difficult as it appears to be. And I'm going to focus on uh, a few issues, but before I do, I wanna remind you that on September 10th through 14th, Dr. Don Resnick uh, will be presenting a course on the upper extremities, uh, along with Megan Mills and Christine Chung for the hand, wrist, and fingers, and I will be doing the case reviews in between the lectures. Uh, the lectures will be interactive. There'll be case reviews that are scrolled, uh, and approximately three-hour sessions each day, and we're going to be focused on the shoulder, the elbow, the hand and wrist, the fingers, and entrapment neuropathy. So uh, hopefully you'll tune in and get some of your pressing questions regarding uh, the upper extremity uh, in front of us. So what we cover in this lecture is technique and anatomy, the triangular fibrocartilage, ulnar variants, simple carpal instability, complex carpal instability, and slack and snack wrist. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on uh, uh, things like uh, masses and soft tissue lesions and arthritis since we're, we're time constrained. Uh, let's start out with technique. And um, I am showing you on the right, a rigid wrist coil with the arm at the side. I typically like to have the arm a little bit closer to the body. Uh, I scan my patients with either the thumb up in the neutral position or in pronation. Uh, most people cannot hold still in supination. And the goal is to get something, you know, like this, which is a high resolution image, two millimeters slice thickness, high matrix. And you can even see the, the trabecula of the bone, the triangular fibrocartilage with its radial and peripheral and distal attachments. But I'm showing it for the anatomic detail, uh, which is greatly influenced by the field of view. And the wrist, I don't like to have fields of view of greater than 12. Uh, on the average, with a, well, a high quality instrument, I like my fields of view to be around eight, maybe nine. And that one was about seven or eight. Here's a patient uh, with the arm at the side, another rigid uh, wrist coil. This time the, the hand is in pronation and we're asking them to perform a clenched fist view to look at the ulnar variants. More on that in a few moments. Here's another uh, rigid coil with the thumb up in the neutral position. Now, as far as the sequences go, this applies across the board. T1 is used for bone marrow in any, in any body part. Uh, we'll use gradient echo either 2D or 3D uh, for intra-articular assessment, the capsule and the cartilage. And there are some fancy new gradient echo sequences known as adage from Hitachi, Merge from GE, Merge Fast Field Echo from Philips, and Medic from Siemens, along with a related sequence called Steady State Free Precession or Fiesta from General Electric that are used in the wrist to get an arth arthrographic and joint effect. 
at high field, I personally like the proton density, uh, spectrally sensitive inversion recovery over the T2 fat suppression. Some of my colleagues on the West Coast prefer the T2 fat suppression, but I, I feel like I get a little more signal, a little more pop with, with this sequence. That's not to say I don't have a T2, uh, but I always have this as part of my workhorse sequence for any joint. At low field, I'll use short time inversion recovery or STIR, and then I'll use T2 to characterize uh, tendon injuries and to date them. When I say date, I mean acute, subacute, chronic, remote, and so on. So when I start out, I put up my coronal sequences first because I'm most comfortable there. You know, from, from doing radiography for so many years, uh, I'll put up, say, the T1, the gradient echo, the T2, and the proton density spur if I have all of them. But I will initially focus on the heavily water-weighted sequence, the proton density fat suppression, looking for hot spots that makes it particularly easy and quick and expedient and pragmatic to interpret. So here's a hairline fracture at the distal uh, waist and tubercle region of, of the scaphoid. So easy to see. There's the crack and there's the edema surrounding it. Here are three sequences, the T1 that you've already seen, an anatomy sequence, and then in the center is a low field sequence, a 2D gradient echo. Some of you know it, know it as a field echo, gradient echo, flash. And then on the left is a 3D gradient echo sequence with slightly thinner sections. And I'm sure you're all seeing this, um, this granulation tissue that's involving the lunate. That's not why I'm showing it. I'm showing it for the shininess of the gradient echo, the ability to see into the joint, these linear black areas are the collapsed capsule. The slightly brighter areas on either side represent synovium and the hyaline cartilage. And you can see that best on this 3D gradient echo sequence. By the way, you can also see it on the T1. There's the very thin collapsed capsule in black, and there are the hyaline cartilages on either side that are gray. Now, a related sequence to these, these gradient echo sequences is the steady state free procession, also known as Fiesta. And this sequence also gives you heavy water weighting. It's very robust, so it allows you to get the field of view down to around seven, six, five. These are one millimeter slices, 1.2 millimeters. And look at the band like portion of the scapholunate ligament. That's gorgeous. The radial collateral ligament, the lunato traquitral ligament, which is intact, and then some tearing out here in the periphery of the TFC. But I'm showing it for technique not necessarily for pathology just yet. Now, some extreme situations. Um, I'm going to use extreme pronation and, and supination uh, to evaluate the radial ulnar joint, and I'll do it with both hands. Now, I can't see myself. Am I on video, guys? I'm on video. So extreme pronation and extreme supination will allow me to assess the radial ulnar excursion on the two sides. So it's really hard to make that interpretation uh, on one side only. So I will do it bilaterally. You can do it with CT, you can do it with MRI. And I haven't had any trouble getting that reimbursed by uh, insurance companies here in the United States. Then we've got steep radial and ulnar deviation that I use for the proximal carpal intrinsics, the scapholunate and the lunato triquitral ligament, such that I very uncommonly have to do an arthrogram of the wrist. Then I've got scaphoid views, what I call compound oblique images that I perform on CT and MR. And then I also have some sequences and positions that I use for radial ulnar relationships. This is known as variance. And sometimes I'll use a clenched fist view for, for that purpose. And sometimes I'll bring the patient back for some of these sequences. So here we are in supination and pronation showing you that there can be quite dramatic excursion between the radius and the, the center of the ulna, and it is extremely helpful and much more reliable to have bilateral assessment of both risks uh, to make such a diagnosis. Now, here is a, a coronal reconstruction of a, a wrist, but if you're imaging that wrist axially and it's for a scaphoid problem, you do not want to you do not want to image in the orthogonal axial projection. You really want obliques, what we call compound oblique scaphoid views. So you take your, your scaphoid, you draw a long axis down it, there's a compression screw in place, and then you get this, which is a short axis oblique. You then take another oblique off that, so you can see it's a very compound 
uh, sequence. We're starting to see the fracture. We're starting to see the screw. We get something that looks like this. Another compound oblique along the long axis of the screw. There's the fracture right there. And now we have the entirety of the scaphoid in view. We can scroll that. We can count slices. We want 50% bridging, 5-0, to allow a player to return to any type of contact sport, lacrosse, American football, and, and so on. You can see a lucency here. I'm showing it for the technique. There is the compression screw seen its in enti entirety in normal position. And then you can scroll through that. And as you get to the next slice, you can see there is an area of, of malunion. And you have to count slices to get to that 50% number that allows that patient go, to go back to their activity. Similarly, compound oblique on MRI. There's the first oblique. There's the second oblique. And then here is the final oblique result of that, which is a long axis view of the scaphoid laid out in profile, this one being normal. Here's another example of a special sequence. Again, I, I, I don't often inject the wrist. When I do, it's either a scapho-radial injection or a radial ulnar joint injection. Um, maybe one out of 100 would, would be as frequently as I do it. Here's a patient, non-contrast. They did put contrast into this joint, did not need it. Highly suspicious for uh, scapholunate ligament insult because the space is too wide. It's a little too swollen. Hey, your all radiologist, compare that with the ulnotriquetral interval. They look very different from one another. There's a little brighter signal right here. And then the secondary sign of invagination of capsulosynovial tissue into the lunate best seen here when we ulnar deviate the fluid kind of comes in and shows you this big gap but you really didn't need it you could have gotten it with ulnar deviation without the contrast inserted into the wrist why did we do it the clinician just wanted it projections this also is a rule of thumb that applies throughout the body axial that's you know that's our comfort zone you know we're used to looking at axials so we use this for masses for tunnel syndromes. I also use it for loose bodies, by the way. The sagittal view, anything that's running long, so tendons, vessels, and also I use it to look at various complex instabilities. The coronal, the workhorse sequence for the wrist, I use it for all else, especially the triangular fibrocartilage. Let's start out with a little bit of axial imaging. Here we are at the tubercle of the trapezium, the proximal carpal tunnel space, there is the flexor retinaculum. Here is the canal in which the ulnar nerve subsists. This is Guillaume's canal. Here's the carpal tunnel space. The median nerve often round or triangular, surrounded by the sublimus tendons. Deep are the profundus tendons. Here's the flexor pollicis longus. Here's the flexor carpi radialis, which goes towards the, the greater multangular. And then as we get a little more distal, we're at the distal carpal tunnel level. We know that because hook of the hamate. So tubercle of the trapezium proximal with the pisiform, hook of the hamate distal. Although not drawn that way, the median nerve tends to be flatter at this level with a lot of the same anatomic structures you saw before. And the ulnar nerve is divided into a deep motor and a superficial radial, uh, a superficial uh, uh, sensory branch. So here is the extensor compartment, and we have uh, any one of six compartments here. We've got the first, the abductor pollicis longus, the extensor pollicis brevis. One way to remember this is longus brevis, longus brevis, longus, and then you're off and running. So abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, longus brevis, extensor pollicis longus, back to longus. Then we're at the communal tendons. Then we're at the extensor digiti minimi, easy to remember because of the pinky finger and the extensor carpial naris with its subsheath to be differentiated from the superficial retinaculum. And then here are our flexor tendons that we described earlier. I don't think we need a second description for them. The sagittal projection, using this for instabilities, alignment, tendons, vessels, anything that's long and straight, and also for the pisotriquetral articulation. Here are those tendons. Here are the profundus tendons right here. Profundus tendon, sublimus tendon. 
We're at the midline. We've got the capitate. We've got the lunate. We've got the radius. They're all lining up relatively straight. So we have what we call our mid, middle column alignment. Unfortunately, my, my pen is not working today. Okay, we've got our middle column alignment that goes from distal to proximal and goes right through, bisects the capitate, bisects the lunate, bisects the radius. And then here with a yellow arrow is the attachment of the radio scapho capitate ligament, which prevents, not shown yet, stay tuned, rotatory subluxation of the scaphoid. We're gonna see one detached a little bit later. And here's the short radio lunate ligament drawn in, little hard to see on the MRI. Here's a series of sagittal views showing the normal architecture and alignment of the metacarpals, the, uh, the lunate, and the scaphoid. And if we look at the angle of the scaphoid and go straight distal to proximal in an orthogonal fashion, this angle right here along the long axis of the scaphoid between these two should be around 45 to 60 degrees. So if the lunate, uh, sorry, if the scaphoid starts to rotate and sag downwards so that it's almost horizontal, we know that we have a rotatory instability problem. It's that simple. And I try not to do, you know, too much unnecessary measuring. And I use my, my eye a lot for expediency. So back to this high resolution coronal uh, T1 weighted image. Uh, this is the workhorse for the wrist. We see the scapholunate and lunatotriquetral ligaments. Here is the rather um, trapezoidal shape of the triangular fibrocartilage. It looks triangular in the axial projection. Here are the radial attachments. No, that's not a tear. That is radial hyaline cartilage. That is ulnar hyaline cartilage and synovium. There is the foveal attachment right there. There's the styloidal attachment. And right there is one of the distal attachments known as the ulnocarpal attachment. These wispy structures represent the ulnar collateral ligament, not a true ligament, but a condensation of the ulnar capsule. Let's move on now and discuss in greater detail one of the most important structures, the triangular fibrocartilage complex. The complex consists of the fibrocartilage-like structure, its radial attachment, the distal radial ulnar articulation, the tissues underneath between it and the hyaline cartilage of the ulna, the hyaline cartilage of the lunate, the cortex of the lunate. Here's the meniscus homolog. It's an artifact of preparation, but here's the small triangular shaped lunato triquetral ligament. And this vascular pedicle here right in the middle is known as the ligamentum cruetum. Then just distal to the ulnar styloid is the pre-styloid recess. Here's the MR that matches that, T1 on the left, um, water weighted on the right. There is the radial hyaline cartilage. There is its attachment. There's the distal radial ulnar articulation, mostly collapsed, tiny bit of fluid inside it. There is the synovium and hyaline cartilage of the ulna, that of the lunate, the lunato triquetral ligament, the meniscus homolog, styloidal attachments, which are pretty broad, foveal attachments, which are a little bit more narrow, and there's the hyperintense ligamentum cruetum with the barely seen uh, pre-styloid recess. Still even higher resolution uh, at the level of the radius. There's the radial attachment. Again, do not confuse the radial cartilage with a vertical tear. Most tears are going to be in the central or inner third of the triangular fibro cartilage. There's a little bit of synovium and cartilage of the ulna and the same for the lunate headed over towards the ulno meniscus homolog peripherally. Then here we are, uh, again, higher resolution, drilling down into the ulnar styloid. There's the pre-styloid recess that has a few different variations that are a bit beyond the scope of our discussion today here, highlighted by our white arrow, anatomy on the left, MR on the right. There is the foveal attachment, and here's the broad styloidal attachment with a hyperintense central vascular pedicle, the ligamentum cruetum. Here again, high resolution still. We once again see the triangular fibrocartilage, 
radial attachment, which is pretty broad, peripheral attachment to the meniscus homolog. Here's a foveal attachment, not showing you the, the styloidal attachment in this case. But here's another real interesting structure right here. From the triangular fibrocartilage, there's this subtle structure going to the lunatotriquetral ligament. That is known as the ulnocarpal ligament. There's a similar ligament that goes to the lunate, the ulnolunate ligament, and there's one that goes to the triquetrum, the ulnotriquetral ligament. Neither of those latter two are shown at this juncture, but here is a more peripheral slice. So here's a sagittal slice done out here. We're, we're more apt to see structures that attach the TFC to the triquetrum. Let's have a look. We're all the way out to the ulnar side of the wrist. We've got some basic, basic anatomic drawings here showing you the volar aspect of the wrist right here in the sagittal. Let's focus on this. Here's the triquetrum. Here's the triquetrum. Here is the triangular fibrocartilage with its attachment to the palmar radial ulnar ligament and its distal attachment to the ulnotriquetral attachment right here. There's one dorsally, a dorsal ulnotriquetral attachment, and it blends with the dorsal radial ulnar ligament. So you see the triangular fibrocartilage is tethered anterior, it's tethered posterior, it's tethered medially, it's tethered laterally, it's tethered distally, and it's also tethered proximally. So it's a rather complex structure that is kind of floating like a trampoline supported by any one of a number of, of structures. Now let's talk about the, let's talk about the uh, triangular fibrocartilage classification of injuries. Now I'm not a big classification person. I mean, there's so many classifications for fractures, you could go absolutely bonkers trying to learn them all. But there are certain classification systems that our colleagues like, they rely on it, it's in their comfort zone, therefore you should use it. And who are those clinicians? Hand surgeons. So if you're playing to a general orthopedic surgeon, probably not necessary, certainly not to a family doctor, but to a hand surgeon, gotta know this. So class one, A, central perforation, B, peripheral tear, and with or without a styloid fracture, C, involvement of the distal and sometimes proximal attachments, and D, radial vulsion, which is quite rare. Class one refers to traumatic injuries of the triangular fibrocartilage. You'll see that class two refers to ulnolunate abutment or chronic injuries of the triangular fibrocartilage complex. So here is a central third perforation, the most common type of traumatic injury of the TFC. These are treated conservatively. They're too small to put a stitch in, so you don't operate on them. Uh, you rest them a little bit, and they usually will granulate in a little fluid in the distal radial ulnar articulation. We would call this a palmar 1A, a central perforation. And the clinician would immediately understand what you're talking about. Here is our palmar 1A in the sagittal projection. There are dorsal attachments to the dorsal radial ulnar ligament. Our volar attachment is right here. We don't see our uh, volar ulnotriquetral attachment very well, but we will later in another case. There is our hourglass shape TFC. There's our tear, our vertical tear. Not so vertical. It's a little bit oblique in the sagittal. It's kind of like looking at menisci of the knee. And here is our triangular shape right there of our TFC. We're missing this part of the triangle right here because it's torn, allowing fluid to exit from the distal radial ulnar joint into the volar recess. Here's another example of a traumatic TFC tear. This time, we are not involving the central third of the TFC. We're involving the periphery. Let's have a look. Periphery doesn't look too bad. There's the meniscus homolog, and it is blending with the ulnotriquetral ligament. There's the LT ligament, the attachment of the TFC to the LT ligament. And as we keep going, look at what happens. The periphery turns to mush. We don't see a strong, dark, band-like or fan-like attachment to the ulnar styloid, nor to the fovea. It is detached. This high signal intensity material is edema in the ligamentum cruetum. There's swelling of the prestyloid recess.
And you can see some of the attachments dorsally right here in the sagittal projection. And there is a volar attachment right there. So this is a peripheral TFC tear 1B. There's another one. This, is, this one is a bit more central. I promised I would show you the, the uh, ulnotriquetral ligament. There is a central tear, but there's also a peripheral tear too. It's a little bit swollen out here. Now, if you go back and remember the, the one that I showed you earlier on was a bit thinner. It wasn't so blurry looking. Here's your TFC. Here's some intrinsic tearing of the TFC, but there is your fat, chubby uh, uh, ligament that goes to the triquetrum uh, as part of the TFC peripheral distal stabilization. And here it is again, look how fat that thing is. So the patient has both a central injury and a peripheral slash distal injury. Let's talk about variance now. Variance is the relationship between the ulnar platform and the radial platform. So if you take this crux right here between the styloid and the body, and you compare it to the free edge of the radius, it should be about eight millimeters either way within that line. If it's too far forward, positive ulnar variance. If it's too far back, negative ulnar variance. Here's an example of somebody with negative ulnar variance. You're more than a centimeter proximal to the free edge of the radius. What happens to these people? Unbeknownst to many of you, they have a high incidence of extensor carpi ulnaris injuries they have a high incidence of peripheral, not central, peripheral TFCC injuries. And they also have, this is a board question, an increased incidence of Keenbox disease or lunate necrosis. Positive impaction syndrome may impact the lunate, may impact the TFC, the lunate triquetral ligament, and you can even get styloidal impaction on the triquetrum. Here is an example of the classification system for these types of impaction. This is the Palmar class two system. Thinning of the TFC due to wear, A. B, lunado or ulnochondromalacia. C, perforation of the central TFC. D, dreaded tearing of the lunado triquetral ligament and E, generalized carpal arthritis. Let's have a look, this is an easy one. The patient has had a very serious complex bridged fracture of the radius. There is foreshortening. The fovea of the scaphoid right here is destroyed. There's some arthritis developing in the lunate, but, but the money is over here where the ulna is jutting way forward relative to the free edge of the radius. It has just destroyed the triangular fibrocartilage. It's hard to see a triangular shaped LT ligament. It's torn and there's extensive irregularity in the periphery of the TFCC. Severe end-stage abutment in acquired positive ulnar variance from a prior radial fracture. Here's another one. This time, we are not impacting the central third so much of the TFC, even though it is a bit attenuated. So there's some disease here, but I am showing it for this. This is a piece of the ulnar styloid that has broken off that in ulnar deviation is getting slammed into the triquetrum. Now, normally there is a little indentation here of the triquetrum, so you don't want to confuse that with an OCD. But when you see this object fitting in the indentation, and then you have edema deep to the indentation, you know that you are impacting the structure against the triquetrum, and the patient has also torn their ulnar capsule. Here's another Example of a TFCC injury, this time not positive ulnar variance, but negative ulnar variance. Now you know, Keenbox disease, we don't have that in this case. But what do we have? An increased risk for extensor carpi ulnaris injuries and peripheral TFCC tears. Let's have a look. Negative ulnar variance, there's our ulnar styloid, there's our body and the crotch or crux between the styloid and the body, way proximal to, to the radius, there's our TFC. It does not land on the styloid. It does not land on the fovea. It does not have a clean attachment to the distal lunado triquetral ligament. And 
we never really identify a distal uh, attachment to the triquetrum right here. We do see a proximal one, but not a distal one. And look posteriorly. Posteriorly, there's no attachments to the dorsal radial nerve ligament. It's just mashed potato swelling of the posterior aspect of the wrist. So we have a dorsal attachment problem, a peripheral attachment problem, all associated with negative ulnar variance. And we better check, we're not doing it yet, but we better check the ECU, which we would do as the next step. Let's turn our attention back to the extensor tendons. Remember, we've got longus brevis, longus brevis, longus, and then the digitorum, the digiti minimi, and the ECU. Another important structure in this projection is Lister's tubercle. For fractures, irregularities, and deformities of Lister's tubercle may lead to contraction of the extensor retinaculum. And as the EPL crosses over here to meet the thumb, these two structures, compartment two and three, may friction over one another, may rub together and give you what's known as distal intersection syndrome. So let's talk about intersection syndrome. I'm not going to show you that intersection syndrome. I'm going to show you a couple of others. And, um, but let's start out with the, the most common intersection syndrome in younger individuals, sorry, the most common extensor tendon that is affected in, in, in younger individuals, not intersection syndrome. And that is below age 80, and that is the ECU. That is affected more frequently in people with ulnar variants. Compartment number one, the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis, which you know as the de Quervan compartment, uh, has a crossing of the, the two structures. And so that is a form of intersection syndrome, namely de Quervan's disease. And you do get contraction of the retinaculum that leads to stenosing uh, tenosynovitis. And then there's another intersection syndrome that I'll show you a little bit later very briefly, that occurs in the arm between the extensor pollicis longus and the extensor carpi radialis, similar to that in the hand. So three intersection syndromes, one in the forearm, one in the de Quervan compartment, and one in the hand between compartments two and three. And as we said, fractures of Lister's tubercle and deformities of such put the patient at risk for intersection syndrome. So here's an example of De Quervan, compartment number one, intersection syndrome, where there is marked hypertrophic irregularity and proliferation of soft tissue and even synovial tissue. And remember, these structures have multiple tendon slips. So it's very common to overdiagnose interstitial laminar tears of the first compartment. So you have to be very careful about that diagnosis and use the axial projection with, with a, a very discreet, near full depth area of signal to make the diagnosis of a tear, as opposed to hypertrophic, deforming, stenosing tenosynovitis, which is a subset of intersection syndrome. There's also an erosion of the radial styloid. More on that a bit later. Here we are in the short axis view. There is so much inflammatory tissue from this crossover intersection stenosing tenosynovitis that you can hardly see the tendons. You see them very as very, very tiny, dark little structures. But remember, there are multiple tendon slips here. And this seeming discontinuity does not in itself mean that there is a tear. Now, this is describing the anatomy of the, the crossover syndrome. This is going to take a little too much time. I just want to point out to you that in the forearm, there is a third intersection syndrome, the proximal type. And this is what it looks like. And, and I'm not going to talk too much about that today. I just wanted you to see that there are multiple intersection syndromes. And as you get more distal into the wrist, it persists. So not only does this patient have it in the upper arm, they also have it in the hand right there. Look at the swelling around the EPL and the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. Those three together are showing you that this patient has both proximal and distal crossover or intersection syndrome. Three types, and you've seen all three. The extensor carpial narrus, we said this is the most common extensor tendon to be affected in young individuals. The most common in elderly individuals is the first, the de Quervan compartment. 
The ECU inserts on the base of the fifth that's held in place by a subsheath, not a retinaculum, a subsheath. Over top of that is the extensor retinaculum, and there are stabilizing fi fibers of the linea jagata, which extend from the base of the ulnar styloid to the extensor retinaculum. Subsheath injuries, even with an intact extensor retinaculum, often lead to subluxation. So here's a diagram showing you the ECU in its groove. I allow a fair amount of latitude to the ECU as long as I don't see swelling there. I don't mind if it perches on the styloid as long as I can see this or I have no swelling and no focal high signal in the tendon itself. Now, don't confuse the extensor retinaculum with the subsheath. If it's perched and I have swelling and I have a subsheath that's interrupted, I get worried and I'm going to call it out. So here we are with four consecutive views. This is the ECU part one. There's part two. There's no two parts to the ECU. It is split, much like you would see a split of the perineus brevis in the foot. There is the subsheath right there. That's the retinaculum on top of that. Yes, very, very subtle teased out findings. There is the interruption of the subsheath that has allowed the ECU to split and portions of it to dislocate over top of the ulnar styloid. Here's some other examples of ECU disease. Now, I'm not going to get into tendons per se, because we're going to talk a lot about that in the September course with Dr. Drs. Resnick and Chung and colleagues. But, you know, there's peritendinitis, there's paratendinitis, there's tendinopathy, there's tendinosis, there's tendinitis. And we're going to winnow those out for you at, at a later date. But right now, I want to show you an example of tenosynovitis. To make that diagnosis, your structure has to have synovium. For instance, the Achilles, no synovium. So you don't use the term tenosynovitis. You might, in the proper setting, use the term paratenonitis. More about that on another day. But here we have tenosynovitis with tissue that is not simple fluid, that is synovial hypertrophy and fluid that is protonaceous surrounding the ECU in this patient with RA. Here's another example of an ECU problem. Uh, this patient has ruptured the ECU at the base of the fifth. That was a low field image. Here's a higher field image. Here's a patient that is a pitcher that is complaining vehemently about his uh, ulnar wrist. And he's got this tiny little tear, which probably wouldn't bother me because I'm not throwing a ball 90 miles an hour, but this person is. It's a small interstitial tear of the triangular fibrocartilage. Now let's turn our attention to instability and look at a hand surgeon's uh, classification of instability. We've got acute less than a week, subacute one to six weeks, and chronic greater than six weeks. Then we've also got what's known as constancy, pre-dynamic. There's no instability from malalignment on imaging, only symptoms. Dynamic. Malalignment is only demonstrated with stress views, radial, ulnar, radial deviation, ulnar deviation, pronation, supination, clenched fist view, and then static. There's permanent malalignment seen in the neutral position on a standard MRI. Let's look at some anatomy here. If we can get our uh, video working, I don't think we're going to get it working. Yeah, click. click it. All right. There we go. Thank you. So this is a high resolution image. I want to just let you toggle through it. And I'm going to stop it right here. Let's see if I can back it up. There is your radial collateral ligament. Let's back it up a little bit more. And there are some of your extrinsic ligaments. Look at this extrinsic ligament right here, the radio scaphocapitate ligament. It's a long volar ligament. Here's a short volar ligament. The short volar ligament is known as the arcuate ligament. That's going to be important uh, along with this other ligament here in patients with volar intercalary segmental instability. This one is important in rotatory subluxation of the scaphoid. The one right underneath it, let's see it right here. The one right underneath it is known as the long radial lunate or radio lunato triquetral ligament. Now, I'm not going to get you too involved in the extrinsic so you don't pull your hair out of your head. I want to show you one dorsal extrinsic. But before I do, the volar extrinsics make an inverted V. You've got some long Vs and some short Vs. I'm going to break that down for you in a few moments. 
But just remember, inverted V. There's also a weak spot right here called Perona's space, where none of the Vs really provide a lot of support. So the carpus can come at you and can sag proximally. Very important biomechanical concept because my thing, as opposed to anatomy, is biomechanics. Some of my colleagues are more anatomically oriented, I'm more biomechanically oriented. So now let's keep going and go to the dorsal aspect of the wrist. Here we come. I'm just gonna show you one ligament, so don't get scared. Here it comes. Right here, whoops, oh no. Shouldn't have clicked it. Hold on, I got it. Right here, right there. This is the dorsal intercarpal ligament. Yeah, there's some other ligaments proximal to it too, but this is one that gets injured when you fall on an outstretched hand. Now let's look at some of the intrinsics. Those are some extrinsics. Let's look at the intrinsics. The intrinsics include the scaphalunate ligament, which we see here. I have a little mnemonic, LTV, SLV. SLV, the scaphalunate, uh, sorry, LTV, the lunatotriquetral ligament, is stronger on the volar side. SLD, the scaphalunate ligament, is stronger on the dorsal side. So the dorsal portion of the SL ligament is more band-like. The middle is triangular and sometimes it'll have a little cleft in it. That's okay. I also don't mind this little cleft in the lunatotriquetral ligament as long as the space looks proper. And then as we get into the volar aspect, this is a bit weaker. The SL ligament is kind of trapezoidal in shape. And here are some diagrams to reflect just that. Now let's look at the lunatotriquetral ligament that likes to honor the great artist Salvador Dali with Salvador Dali's bar-shaped mustache. Remember, we said the triangular fibrocartilage has carpal attachments, some to the lunate. We can barely see one right here. Some to the lunatotriquetral ligament known as the ulnocarpal attachments. There's one right there. And then we also showed you earlier some to the triquetrum. There's the base of one right there. All ulnocarpal attachments. But look at our LT ligament. It's a triangular nubbin. It's a broad triangle. It's a crisp triangle with a little bit of a mustache. It's eccentric. It's now got a bilateral bar-shaped mustache. This is all uh, imaging taken from the same patient. So look at the variability. You can see why some people are uncomfortable diagnosing LT ligament tears without an arthrogram. I, however, am not. I'm used to all these variations and I use the secondary signs. The absence of arthritis, no fluid, a collapsed capsule, perfect hyaline cartilage. I am totally comfortable with this LT ligament without putting contrast in the joint. Let's look at some intrinsic failure. Let's look at scaphalunate degeneration and tears, widening synovitis, pseudocysts, erosions. You may get rotation of the lunate. You may get dynamic changes on radial deviation and ulnar deviation, which you've seen already. And you might get the capitate migrating proximally and volarly if the patient develops a more complex pattern of instability. This one's easy. You didn't need an arthrogram. We did it to appease the clinician. You could drive a a Buick through this giant hole between the scaphoid and the lunate. There's the floating scaphalunate ligament. This is the membranous mid triangular portion, but the whole thing was torn from front to back, yet there is no rotation or displacement of the lunate. And there wasn't any rotatory displacement of the scaphoid either. Here's one that's a bit more subtle. I do not need to give contrast in a case like this. I already know that the, the SL ligament is torn. I might do radial and ulnar deviation, but look at the difference between this and this. Now, if I have to know the percent tear, then I might go for the arthrogram, but that is indeed a rare event. And if you look at all the slices at very high resolution, especially with radial and ulnar deviation, you will be able to tease this out. But it is this secondary sign right here of widening and swelling compared to the LT interval that makes the case for you very easily. Here's another one. 
we do see a sick looking but present SL ligament. It's irregularly shaped on the T1. It's a little better shaped on the PD spur, but we know something nasty is going on here because we have arthritis, arthritis there, and a little bit of arthritis here. So right at that intersection, we've got micro instability. So in a case like this, if my radial and ulnar deviation fails to show the widening that I'm anticipating, then this might be one of those cases where we would inject and perform an MR arthrogram. Case like this, not. By the way, in that last case, we did. This was not a full thickness tear. There was no communication. It was just a stretched insufficient ligament that allowed for micro instability. Here's one that's obvious. Uh, there's a huge defect here, the so-called Terry Thomas sign with a space in the incisor tooths uh, of the front of the mouth right there. There's the lunate, there's the scaphoid, and then the axial, which shows you the scapholunate ligament, which was here and has now fallen into this hole. There it is. It's trapped inside between the scaphoid and the lunate. So this is one that's going to need a surgical extraction. Radial ulnar failure. This happens when you have insufficiency of the volar, less commonly the dorsal radial ulnar uh, ligament. It allows for excessive excursion of the ulna related to the radius. You put a, a dot in the middle of the ulna, a dot in the middle of the radius, and you should stay within about five to eight millimeters of the central dots of both when you go into steep pronation and and supination, but there's going to be some movement and comparison with the other side is important. Now, when you're looking at these spaces, a knowledge of their communication is important, and we will drill into that at our combined course in September. Um, the radial ulnar bursa communicates with a horseshoe-shaped hand bursa about 70% of the time. There are other bursa in the wrist. There's a thenar bursa, there's a mid-carpal bursa, there's a flexor pollicis longus bursa, and those will be stories for another day. But here's an axial diagram and an axial MRI. Look at that dorsal floating ulna. There's a little bit of the triangular fibrocartilage. We can't see the volar ligament because it's a T1 weighted image. You'll see it in a minute, but look at how dorsally displaced the ulna is. And there's a stubby stump of the dorsal attachment of the TFC to the trichoetromite there. It just ends pretty suddenly. So it's a rather complex case, but I'm showing it for the volar radial ulnar ligament tear. There's one end of the volar radial ligament. There's the frayed, destroyed volar radial ulnar ligament. There's the dorsal floating ulna. And because of the stresses it puts and the stretch on the extensor support of the ECU, the ECU is now starting to plow its way through the subsheath and retinaculum. So everything is really A is connected to B, connected to C. And if you know what you're looking for, you're more likely to, to find it. Here's a patient with radial ulnar instability for years. Look at the widening of the radial ulnar articulation and then the sagittal projection. You'd make this diagnosis on a plane film, but many people do miss it. Look at the dorsal displacement of the ulna and look at the very irregular chopped up appearance of the dorsal aspect of the TFC. Here it looks pretty good other than being thinned. It's very thin. Here it looks a little irregular, but here it's just attenuated dorsally. So the dorsal attachments are gone. Here's yet another one. This is a patient without a lot of displacement of the ulna, but with severe chronic longstanding wrist pain. It is an athlete. Look at the fluid in the distal radial ulnar articulation. And there's one end, one end, and there's the other end, of the normally connected volar radial ulnar ligament. There's the defect right there. So volar radial ulnar ligament uh, rupture with uh, dynamic radial ulnar instability. So on the static, it didn't look unstable, but on the dynamic, that thing floated all over the place. Extrinsics. We've already talked about some of the key extrinsics. One is the radioscaphocapitate ligament. The other is the long radiolunato triquetral ligament. We're just going to focus on this one today. We look at it all the time when we have complex instabilities, and those are really the two you should concentrate on. These short ligaments I'm not so interested in. This short 
ligament from the hamate to the capitate. I'm not so interested in you learning about it, but just know that this is one of the divisions of the arcuate ligament that helps support the center of the mid-carpal space and prevents the capitate from coming at you and migrating proximally, especially in, especially in volar, intercalary, segmental instability. So this is your big one here. This is primary. This one is your, your secondary area of interest. And in the volar wrist, the ligaments make an inverted V. So here's a little bit uh, of drilling down into the extrinsics. Again, here is our radioscapho capitate uh, ligament. Here's another long ligament that also supports the ulnar aspect of the wrist. Here's that short hamato capitate ligament. And together, these will be disrupted in patients with visi and an ulnar sided wrist clunk. In dorsal intercalary segmental instability, uh, these may be compromised along with the scapho lunate ligament. And here are two short ligaments known as the arcuate ligaments. When these tear, this is going to allow for a complex instability. Again, the capitate's gonna migrate proximal and it's gonna come at you and may lead to volar intercalary segmental instability. Here are these short arcuate ligaments in the mid carpal space, deep to the carpal tunnel space. And when these structures start to sag anteriorly, they can compromise the median nerve. Here, is, here are the dorsal extrinsics. They make a sideways V. And the one I'm most interested in is the dorsal intercarpal ligament, the upper limb of the V, or that one gets injured when you fall on an outstretched hand. And here it is. Falling on an outstretched hand, the patient has bled into the dorsal intercarpal ligament. The treatment is completely conservative. Finally, complex carpal instabilities. Let's start out with dorsal intercalary segmental instability. While my pen isn't working, you can see that there is a straight alignment between the metacarpal, the capitate, the lunate, and the radius. If the lunate starts to turn dorsally facing, we call that dorsal intercalary segmental instability. It may or may not be associated with rupture of the radioscapho capitate ligament. Here's a normal radio scapho capitate ligament. Here's a patient with dorsal intercalary segmental instability. No, the radio scapho capitate ligament is not obviously torn on this image, but I just want to show you the dorsal facing lunate. It is highly unlikely that this patient is going to have an intact scapho lunate ligament even before looking. There's another example of a normal reference there's our straight alignment between metacarpal capitate lunate and radius. And our scaphoid is going to be at about a 60 degree angle. I'll show you what I mean in a moment. But let's turn our attention not to dorsal intercalary segmental instability, a dorsal facing lunate, but a volar facing lunate. Yeah, we're volar because there are the flexor digitorum sublimus and profundus tendons. There is your median nerve volume averaged. You are facing palmar. And look at the mid-carpal space. It is destroyed. Look at how the capitate is starting to work its way proximal and anterior on its way to producing secondary carpal tunnel syndrome in a patient with visi position or visi posture and severe injury of the lunato triquetral ligament and other intrinsics. Here's another complex instability. SL ligament, no problem. You don't need contrast for this. There's a giant hole here. There are the two limbs of the ligament. The LT ligament is absolutely positively intact. And the space between the triquetrum and the lunate is perfect. Here's the sagittal of this patient. The lunate is starting to face dorsally. And the radioscapho capitate ligament is starting to delaminate right there. It is not allowed the scaphoid to rotate or sag yet, but it will coming to a theater near you very shortly. So a little bit of extrinsic delamination, some dissy, a big SL ligament tear, but no rotatory subluxation of the scaphoid. Finally, we finished with scapholunate advanced collapse and some more advanced instabilities. This is also known as slack wrist. You are looking for proximal capitate migration. 
the, the lunate may migrate to the ulnar side, so-called ulnar translocation of the lunate. As you've seen, there is extensive arthritis. One of the earliest signs and a stage one of slack wrist radial styloid hypertrophy. You can get secondary AVN of the lunate, scaphoid rotation, destruction of the scaphoid and then lunate fossa of the radius. And then finally, carpal tunnel syndrome. Here is the Watson classification or a modification of it showing the four stages of slack wrist. Degenerative changes only in the scaphoid styloid tip. Easy. Two, involvement of the scaphoid fossa of the radius. Three, involvement of the lunate fossa of the radius. And four, involvement of the wrist in its entirety. Let's have a look at a slack one, sorry, slack two wrist. Why is it a two? It's a two because there is some styloidal involvement right there. Look at how pointy it is. That's one of the earliest signs of slack wrist, a pointed radial styloid. Yes, an obvious SL ligament tear. Yes, there is some osteoarthritis and some erosions, but why is it not a one? Why is it a two? Because there is marked narrowing of the scaphoid fossa cartilage where the scaphoid sits in the radius. Look at the gradient echo, almost bone to bone. There's still some cartilage here, but there's no cartilage here. So styloid plus radial fossa, stage two slack wrist with scapholunate ligament rupture. And to make matters worse, the radioscaphocapitate ligament ruptured. There it is right there, horn. And the, the scaphoid is now rotating in a clockwise fashion. No longer do you have uh, 60 degrees of angulation between the scaphoid and a vertical line drawn in this fashion. It's almost horizontally oriented. So this patient has a complex pattern of instability that involved rupture of the radioscaphocapitate ligament. Here's another one that's very complex. The SL ligament is destroyed. The lunate is now translocating to the ulnar side, just as we said it would in late stage slack wrist. The hamate and the capitate are migrating proximally and getting destroyed at their base. They're also migrating into a ventral position, likely to encroach on the median nerve. The TFC has been destroyed. The LT ligament has been destroyed and there is rotatory malalignment between the lunate and the triquetrum. So the intrinsics are completely wiped out. If we look at the lunate, it is volar facing. It's facing this way. So the patient also has visi. Now this time we have a stage three slack wrist. Why is it stage three? Because we have the radial tip involved, not shown. We have the radial fossa involved. I didn't show it quite as well as I, I might have liked, but now the lunate fossa is involved right there. Extensive erosive change of the lunate fossa with a small erosion and cyst or pseudocyst that, that is proliferating. So now with lunate fossa involvement, we're at stage three. The whole wrist takes you to stage four. And here we are at stage four in this patient with a Kissin cousin of slack wrist, the snack wrist. No, it's not Frito Lay snacks. It is scaphoid non union advanced collapse. This is one proximal fragment of the scaphoid. There's the other fragment. So this joint is now serving as a ligament where there is widening and instability. There is extensive erosion of the scaphoid fossa. There is a pointed radial styloid. Not shown, there was involvement of the lunate fossa, but look at that generalized degeneration of the entire carpus with a dorsal facing lunate with osteoarthritic spurs, stage four slack wrist with dorsal intercalary segmental instability and with a fracture really making it a snack wrist rather than a slack wrist. And here it is on the water weighted image. Look at that massive proximal capitate migration ulnar translocation uh, of the lunate. And now you cannot even see the median nerve. It's right over here. It's this flat, tiny little pancake that is compressed by the volar displacement of the capitate and hamate. And look at the thenar eminence. Hypothenar looks fine. The patient virtually has no thenar eminence. So end stage 
carpal tunnel syndrome from end stage class four slack wrist. So that concludes our, our discussion today. I've taken you through some basic anatomy, some basic tenets of uh, selective imaging, sequences like radial and ulnar deviation, pronation, supination, compound uh, scaphoid views. I took you through the details of the triangular fibrocartilage, the Palmer 1 traumatic classification system, the Palmer 2 abutment classification system. Then we looked at some intrinsic and extrinsic ligaments and finished with some very complex instabilities of the wrist. And with that, I'll take some questions. All right. Yes. Thank you uh, for sharing your lecture today, Dr. P. Um, at this time, we open the floor for any questions from our audience. Uh, you can submit your questions to Dr. Pomerantz through the Q&A feature. Uh, Dr. Pomerantz, would you like me to do my best to read you the questions or can you see them? I can see them. So UCL is considered part of the TFC or not. The TF TFCC or not. TFCC is kind of a wastebasket. So everything goes in there. So the ulnar collateral ligament is in most circles considered part of the, the TFCC. It's not a critically important structure since it doesn't provide a lot of instability. It's usually used as an indirect sign of other things uh, that are happening, such as the case that I showed you. So the answer is it is. How reliable is various var variance assessment on MRI? Um, doesn't patient positioning affect this? It absolutely does. You'll notice in my slides, I didn't say ulnar variance positive. I said positive variance posture because hand surgeons are like neurosurgeons, detail oriented, thank God. OCD, not to a fault, they're OCD, thank God they are. So they are very specific about how they want their variance measured on conventional radiography. And that is why I use the term posture. However, you have an obligation to use a little bit of common sense. So let's say you're more than eight millimeters distal to the radius with your ulna. Look at what's happening around you. If the TFC is thin, if there's fluid in the radial ulnar articulation, if there is lunatochondromalacia, you have an obligation to call out that ulnar positive variance posture to protect yourself and say that the patient has secondary signs of ulno lunate abutment syndrome. So I absolutely use the secondary signs to put myself on sound footing as it relates to variants when dealing with hand surgeons who have very strict criteria for such. Um, which protocol would you recommend when evaluating a vitality of bone on MRI? For instance, in the case of Keenbox disease or scaphoid fracture, is T1 fat sat before and after contrast injection sufficient or the only examination that can get the optimal and realistic results when we use perfusion sequences? Well, first of all, I wouldn't do perfusion imaging if I have a uniform or nearly uniform black, slightly collapsed or markedly collapsed, you know, lunate. Now, if somebody, you know, has a normal size lunate and it, it's an indeterminate keen box case, or they're trying to determine how much is viable and how much is not viable, which wouldn't be in a uniform black lunate, then I will do dynamic contrast imaging just as I might do with say a breast MRI. I'll do very fast fat suppression, gradient echo imaging, and um, you know maybe a slice every three seconds or so. You don't have to be too, too quick with it and look at how the lunate perfuses. How often do I do that? Maybe two to three times a year. I've done it a few times in the scaphoid as well, but, but it, isn't, it isn't standard practice for me, but that's the best way to do it. Kind of mimicking the dynamic breast protocol. Next, please. Any other question? How much physiologic fluid is there in the distal radial ulnar joint? I allow a slit. What's a slit? A millimeter of fluid. There's going to be some subjectivity there, but it's going to be a very, a very tiny amount. And it's also going to depend on patient age. For instance, if I have a 15-year-old, I don't want to see any fluid there. If I have a 50-year-old, I'll allow a millimeter of, you know, lubricating fluid and, you know, potential overuse and, and so on. You know, if, if I'm on the fence, I'm looking at everything else. I'm looking at the 
the volar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments. I'm looking at the intrinsics. I'm looking at the adjacent uh, radial ulnar cartilage using indirect signs to make that decision. Next question, what is the significance of the space of Poirier? Well, the space of Poirier is this sort of weakness that occurs between those short volar blue ligaments that I drew for you that is kind of right in the middle, just volar to the capitate. It is important because it's an area of weakness. And when you have these more advanced, complex instabilities, it will allow the capitate to come forward. It allow the capitate to drop down and it can contribute to what you saw at the end, end stage carpal tunnel syndrome. Orthopod tells you to look for ulnar collateral ligament injury, where to look for it and is there any significance? Well, I'm not sure um, an experienced hand surgeon would ever order an MRI for that purpose. We all know that do a lot of wrist imaging that the UCL is a flimsy structure. It is used by us as an indirect sign of other problems, retinacular stripping, ECU disease, and so on. But the best place to look for it is where I showed you, on higher resolution coronal uh, imaging. And it doesn't necessarily matter which sequence, although I, I see it best on a one to two millimeter Fiesta sequence. How reliable is TFCC interpretation on films or on scans done in other places? Do you end up repeating such scans at your place? That's a loaded question. You know, we are a, a tertiary referrals facility. So we do get to see and resolve these usually without contrast. And um, MR is extremely reliable, extremely reliable. I, I hardly ever inject a risk to diagnose a TFC or a TFCC tear. The most common use of contrast for me is in an equivocal LT ligament injury. And that, that is not often. A next question um, about DISI and VISI. Uh, are there standard angles to measure the position of the lunate and scaphoid and capitate bones? There are. If you email me, I'll send you those angles. My, my pen is not working, but as a general rule of thumb, I like the scaphoid to have about a 45 to 60 degree position relative to the vertical. So if I start to see the scaphoid get below 45 degrees and start approaching the horizontal, then I know I have rotatory displacement. Regarding DISI and VISI, that's a little more easy. However, if the technologist puts the, the hand in the scanner and they do this, they only deviate, you are going to create a DISI posture appearance, so-called pseudo DISI. So make sure that your wrist is absolutely straight. And if it is, your lunate should be pointed straight up towards the capitate and straight up towards the base of the third metacarpal. Um, let's see. Question about the ECU. Is the ECU part of the TFCC? It is, as is its subsheet. All right, are there any other questions? 1.5 versus 3T, which one is preferable? They're both fine, absolutely. And you can scan with low field in the wrist because you can get the hand in the center of the magnet bore. So if you can do the right sequences, STIR, then section gradient echo imaging, SARGE, you know, one, two millimeter slices, you absolutely can image the wrist at low field as low as 0.18 Tesla. Okay, I think I have answered all the questions. Doesn't patient positioning affect the ability to assess Dissy, I think I answered that one. You absolutely need to have the wrist straight. If you ulnar deviate, you're going to create pseudo dissy. If you radial deviate, you're going to create pseudo dissy. All right. I think that's about it. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. And I hope to see you all in September for the combined uh, Resnick, Pomerantz, Chung, and colleagues course. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you. Have a great day. Thank you so much again, Dr. Pomeranz. Uh, and thank you to everyone for your questions and participating in our noon conference. You will be able to access the recording of today's conference and all of our previous noon conferences by creating a free MRI online account. And be sure to join us again this week for a noon conference on Thursday, July 27th at 12 p.m. Eastern, Dr. Deborah Baumgarten for a case-based review of renal pathology. You can register for this free lecture at mrionline.com and follow us on social media for updates on future noon conferences. Thanks again and have a great day.